Family, we are here finally at the chapel, uh, the old church, parish church of St. Peter Julian Amard. It was in this church where he was baptized uh, right after he was born. In fact, this behind us is the baptismal font. Now, because the church was almost destroyed and demolished, a lot of the things that have to do with his life are here. He received his first Holy Communion in 1623 here, in 1823 here, and he served as an altar boy, and that altar rail that you see in back of you, which is not used anymore, this was the altar rail where he received his first Holy Communion. And how blessed we are that we have a priest. Who we, we have with us Father Virgil, Virgil from the Philippines. He's a member. <clears throat> excuse me, of the Congregation of the Blessed Sacrament, and you're stationed here at this Yes, I'm assigned here. Uh, talking about the Blessed Sacrament, what really touched my heart was that um, he was found, he, uh, he, it's not that he was hiding, but he went in back of the tabernacle where our dear Lord, we believe our dear Lord is present there. And uh, when they found him, he had his uh, ear to the, the tabernacle and back of the tabernacle. And they said to them, well, oh, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to hear Jesus. my Lord. And I want to hear him clearly tell me what to do. This was as a child. Yes. Now, <clears throat> his family was a very, <clears throat> very religious family. But I don't want you to get the impression that they were not, but his father did not want him to get involved with religious life. He had other plans for his life. Well, and not only that, he was sickly, and he was sickly all his life. So uh, the life of a priest is not easy. So he, he had to study Latin, and his father would not allow him to study Latin. So he had to study Latin secretly. And, and at one point, his father found out that he was studying Latin, and he just about had a fit. Peter was completely crushed. He couldn't believe that this was happening to him. He walked a distance of 30 miles to the shrine of Our Lady of Laos. He wanted to unload all his sorrow and disappointment at the feet of Our Lady, and quite honestly ask her how he could follow his dream of becoming a priest. He actually spoke to Our Lady at her altar at the shrine of Laos through the words, and she answered him, through the words of a priest who was in the chapel at the time, a father touche, who became a lifelong friend and mentor to young Peter. He asked Peter to repeat his tale of grief and frustration. The priest encouraged him to stay the course of his determination to become a priest. He recommended Peter begin receiving communion every week and insisted that he learn Latin. He went through a lot to be able to become a priest. It took a long time, a lot of work. Uh, he would, <clears throat> as a father was telling us, at one point he was too sick. He was sent home and they, uh, they rang the bell for the dead, the dying, as if he was about to die. And, and yet, our Lord, that was not our Lord's plan and he came through that. Uh, you know, for Bob and me, and for our community, and especially for Mother Angelica. This is very important because the center of our community is the Holy, uh, uh, the sacred, <laughs> the Blessed, the blessed sacrament, sacrament. The Eucharist. Is, and is. I, this. And of I course, know. she loves this the fact that there is an order devoted to the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, when we told, two years ago, when we were working on this program, we told one of the people at the network that we would hopefully be finished with it soon. And she said, oh, we love Peter Julian Amart here. We want a program on him. So they're looking forward to us getting this program done. <clears throat> but we were sidetracked for two years. And now we're back and we're getting it done. Um, we want to show you some of the different things about the church. This was supposed to uh, We are thinking that this is the altar that used to be in Montenat, and Montenat is uh, the first parish where he served as a parish priest. Huh? Mm -hmm. So we're thinking that this is where he first
first celebrated his Eucharist uh, After his own? Nearing, nearing his hometown. But, uh, oh no, let me correct that. This is where he celebrated his Eucharist, not necessarily the first. Because the first he celebrated in Notre Dame de Dossier, or Our Lady of the Willows. Right, Our Lady, right, right, I remember that. And it was because it had to do with the Maris. He was involved, yes, yes. He, yes. he was there because he wanted to visit his friends. Yes. And he immediate, immediately after his ordination, he went there to visit his friends and to celebrate that his Eucharist. And but then, he celebrated on this altar, and this no, altar was in that town. In that church. No, this, this is in the church of Montenegro, where he, was, he served as a parish priest. Because Wonderful. before he founded the congregation, he first became uh, a diocesan priest. And after some time, he, after serving the parish of Montenegro, he entered the congregation of the Marys, right. yes. where he became a uh, uh, one of the superiors, in fact, he became one of the, uh, he, he was one of the trusted, uh, of the founder of the Maris, uh, Per Colan. But later, he had a, a, a project, an inspiration, an inspiration that he received while praying in Lyon, the churches of Lyon, especially in St. Paul. Uh, Notre Dame, Notre -Dame de Fauvier. Uh, we were, we were there before. Yes, yes. yes. And there, he had an inspiration to found another congregation that is dedicated to the Eucharist. He saw that, that the Eucharist is the answer to the hunger of the humanity, mm. the hunger of the human family. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us here to Lyon. Lyon, we are here at the Basilica of Notre Dame de Fauvier, high up on a hill in Lyon. And this is where St. Peter, Julian, Amard, and many of the Marists of that time would come to pray, not in the big church that you see over here, but in the little chapel behind us. The big church was not here. The big church was not here at the time of St. Peter, Julian, Amard. It's a beautiful basilica, and it's well worthy of seeing. But it was a little chapel in back of us where St. Peter, Julian, Amard, and his confrere would come and pray and it was here that he made the vow to start the order of the blessed sacrament and this little church like we little people brought life into this community and as a result the magnificent basilica is here the basilica did not start here the little church started here just as we see happening in our own dear country. Now this little church began in the 17th century and it has been frequented by the people of Lyon from that time until this. And as we go inside the chapel, you're gonna see there will be people there praying. Uh, very often there's adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. We wanna show you the, uh, the sign that was made to honor uh, Peter Julian Amard's oath to Our Lady that he would start this order of the Blessed Sacrament. And here we learn a fabulous truth. They can do what they want, say what they want, but they can never kill the love that we have for Jesus and Mary. And our Mother Mary is one of the most famous, famous ladies in France. So stay with us. Stay with us as you go inside and check it out. We love you. We love you. On the 23rd of July, 1816, 12 Marist priests and seminarians climbed the hill to the shrine of Our Lady of Fouvier and placed their promise to found the Society of Mary, the Marists, at that place. And on the 21st of January, 1851, Peter Julian Amard prayed at the shrine of, of Our Lady of Fouvier and was inspired to found the Congregation of the Blessed Sacrament.
As we mentioned before, the original shrine of Our Lady of Notre Dame de Fourvier was built centuries before the big basilica. The big basilica was built uh, in Thanksgiving for having kept the Prussian troops from invading Lyon, much like the Sacre Coeur that was built in Paris in Thanksgiving for having been saved from the Russian Prussian forces uh, during the Franco-Prussian War. The, uh, the people of Lyon uh, thanked Our Lady for having saved them from the attack from, uh, by the Prussians to Lyon. Uh, it was another halt and retreat situation where for no reason at all, the, uh, the troops that were headed for Lyon was stopped, turned around and went back to Paris and that was the end of the Franco-Prussian War. And in Thanksgiving, uh, during the period of 1872 to um, 1884, the, the new basilica, the basilica that you see here, was built. The little chapel had always been here. That's where uh, St. Peter Julian Amad, St. Therese of Lisieux, and Don Bosco came and prayed. Peter's friend, Father de Quer, who had interested him in the, in the prospect of starting the order, asked him to write a set of rules for the order. That's when the whole plan fell apart. Uh, the uh, superior of the Marist told him, you are, you are to stop with this course. You are first of all a Marist, he told him, and that was it. Peter could not believe what he was hearing. Our Lady would never get in the way of giving support to glorifying her son. Wherever you find the mother, you will find the son, and wherever you find the son, you will find the mother. But one thing we knew for sure is that he was obedient, and so he stopped working on the rules. As God would have it, his old friend and spiritual counselor from Laos, Father Touche, stopped to see him. When Peter explained his predicament, Father said, Your project is the work of God, but it must be submitted to the head of the church for testing. Father Touche was on his way to Rome to have an audience with His Holiness Pope Pius IX. He said he would take a petition that Peter drew up and show it to Pope Pius IX. When he did this, he was given, uh, Peter was given the blessings of the Pope, but the implementation would have to be at the discretion of his superiors. Uh, they would not budge. He would not budge. The final decision was that he had to leave the Marists. The idea of leaving the Maris was breaking his heart, and so he wanted to get an impartial opinion. He asked the Archbishop of Paris, so we were, uh, an interview was arranged, and he and his friend, Father Duquer, went to the Archbishop's office in Paris. While they were waiting for the auxiliary bishop to come out, the Archbishop, who never walks a visitor out of his office, did in this instance, and on the way back, he saw the two priests sitting there. He asked what their business was, they told him, and he immediately said, oh, Bishop Sabor has told me all about it. No, no, it's purely contemplative. I'm not in favor of those things. Whereas the Archbishop had no intention of giving Peter a personal audience, because of the circumstances, Peter was able to explain that theirs would not be a contemplative order. Where there would be adoration, they would work to have the adults receive communion, which was sorely lacking in France, especially in Paris. Upon hearing this, the archbishop's interest sparked. He brought the two men into his office where his auxiliary bishop had a priest involved in Eucharistic adoration. They explained Peter's plan and actually sold it to the auxiliary bishop and the priest. 
The following day, a meeting was held with other bishops regarding Peter's request to leave the Maris. They all agreed that he should be released from his vows to the Maris. Within 12 days, the, uh, the uh, Archbishop of Paris approved the new uh, order that he was beginning. He not only approved it, but he gave St. Saint P- Saint Peter Julian his first house in Paris. And on January the 6th, 1857, the Blessed Sacrament was exposed in his chapel for the first time. During the Corpus Christi procession, and while carrying the Blessed Sacrament, he received a grace of faith and love for Christ in the Eucharist. He wrote, These two hours seem only a moment to me. My soul was imbued with lively faith and love for Jesus in his divine sacrament. I do not only preach Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. This is where St. Peter Julian Amard set up his first residence in Paris. The house was falling apart, but they did the best they could to make it presentable. They had no money and had to work as day laborers to make enough to keep themselves going. Initially, he catered to children and working women. He also set up the blessed sacrament stations he promised the archbishop where adult working people could come and receive the Lord on their work hours or off work hours. But he had to change houses. Now there were too many people interested in his work, and it grew so quickly that he had to move. Things had to change. In 1858, they moved again. They were given what was called a miracle chapel due to all the graces and miracles through adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Apparently, the Lord had been speaking to the hearts of many religious in France because the explosion of Eucharistic adoration began in Paris and then went throughout the country. In 1859, Pope Pius IX praised the movement. Spurred on by this endorsement, the order grew in leaps and bounds. Many houses were opened in France. Vocations, which had been slow in coming at first, grew in great proportions, and before long the Order of the Blessed Sacrament became a full-blown congregation of priests and brothers. In December of 1858, Peter and uh, his father de Quer went to Rome to meet with the Holy Father. He was given a cordial welcome and advised to wait a few weeks until the Pope could work on his request for a writ of approval for the community. Uh, On January the 6th, he was given the official approval of the community signed by Pope Pius IX himself. He returned to Paris immediately, letter in hand, to share with his community. They made a week's retreat after which they all took their vows as religious of the Blessed Sacrament in front of the Blessed Sacrament. It was official. The Cenacle in Paris on Faubourg Saint-Jacques became their mother house. Since that time, they opened two other houses in Paris because the community outgrew the quarters which they occupied. Their official house in Paris is on Avenue Friedland near the Arc de Triomphe. Father Amard's health was always tenuous. It seemed like his greatest triumphs were coupled with his greatest bouts of illness. For example, after the community was approved initially by the Archbishop of Paris in May of 1856, he collapsed with pneumonia. And uh, after the uh, trip to Rome in 1863, where they received final approval of the order, he he had great illness on the boat from Marseille to Rome. He suffered from a bout of influenza early in 1868, but he continued working. After preaching and giving retreats, He went on one himself in early 1868. Throughout his life, he had always come back to his roots. Pilgrimages to Our Lady of La Salette and Our Lady of Lowe became a normal part of his spirituality. He would also come to La Muret to visit his sisters who were getting on in years. And then he would visit both shrines of Our Lady in the French Alps. On July the 21st, 1868, he made what turned out to be his last pilgrimage to La Salette 
to celebrate Mass there. Apparently we're standing right in front of the tomb of uh, the original, not the original tomb, but the tomb of uh, St. Peter Julian Amard. The day after he died, his body was brought here and he was buried. And as uh, our priest mentioned to us, the people of the town proclaimed him a saint immediately. He was, he was a very saintly young man. And so they would come for 10 years. They had the gift of being able to come here and pray for the intercession of St. Peter Julian Amand. And many miracles came about, uh, and we know that, that that would uh, uh, help him to become blessed and then uh, canonized as a saint. Uh, also, he has beside him his uh, adopted sister, a uh, half-sister, and a sister. And a half sister. But now, the, yeah. the thing about him being buried here for 10 years, mm -hmm. and then after 10 years, the community of the Blessed Sacrament thought it would be a good thing to bring his body to Paris, to their mother house in Paris. And so they came here to do that, and they caused an, <laughs> such an uproar among the people because they were taking their saint away from them. And there was, uh, there was a lot of grief in <laughs> trying to get the body of St. Peter Julian Amard out of the town, which meant that the people really loved him. But eventually his body was brought up to Paris to the, uh, to the shrine that's there today. I just want to sh share a moment with you. Uh, I am so touched by the generosity of our Lord and Our Lady. Uh, it's taken us two years of trying to get the full story of St. Peter Julian Amart. And here we are, and we're getting more than we ever hoped for, especially with this wonderful priest. Father Virgil. Who is part of the community uh, the community of uh, St. Amart. I'd like to leave you with some insights from the life of St. Peter Julian Amard. From an early age, he was attracted to the Eucharist. He felt a call to the Eucharist. He served Mass. At eight years old, eager to be pure, he made his first confession. He heaped penances upon penances on himself. One day, for example, he went barefoot in the snow and climbed Calvary Hill in La Mure. At age 11, alone and on foot, begging for food, he made his first pilgrimage to Our Lady of Lowe, 70 kilometers distance from La Mure. He would later say that's where he came to know and love Mary. His motto was, God calls me today, tomorrow will be too late. Family, we want to bring you to the final resting place and shrine of St. Peter Julian Amard in Paris. This is where his body was brought 10 years after his death from the little town of La Mure to the shrine in Paris near the Arc de Triomphe.
shots poured up. The original tomb, this is the original tomb of the Curie of Arts. They were very, very friendly. And so he was buried in the Curie of Ars original tomb. And then the Curie of Ars, of course, when you go to Ars, you'll see he's in another one. Very simple. Very simple. We, we would like to close this program with these words of Peter Julian Amard. Belief in the Eucharist is a treasure which we must seek by submissiveness, preserve by piety, and defend at any cost. Not to believe in in the Blessed Sacrament is the greatest of misfortunes. God bless you, family. We love you. We love you.